please welcome to the stage Omalara Fatirigan, founder and CEO, Thrive Industries Incorporated. Hi, I'm Omolara, founder of Thrive, and I am so excited to share my venture story and how we created anti-racist technology to break cycles of poverty. But all of that begins with my family story. So my single, poor black immigrant mom sent both of her kids to Harvard. How did that happen? It was a budget decision. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll tell my mom. So <laughs> my mom worked at a university that made the decision to offer free college to their employees. This allowed mom to go to school at night, become a pharmacist, and transition us out of poverty. With the extra money she had, she enrolled my brother and me in better schools, which changed our lives forever. But we're the lucky ones. Because 84% of kids born in poverty will live in poverty for the rest of their lives. And we know that these are disproportionately black and brown children. How do we stop this? Just like in my own family story, the answer lies in budget decisions, but at the government level. State and local governments spend $3 trillion a year, but due to systemic racism, they perpetuate cycles of poverty. Public schools spend more on police than social workers. Child welfare agencies spend more on foster care than prevention programs that keep kids safe. So, at Thrive, we built software that identifies systemic racism in government spending. Our equity audits compile everything known about how to effectively combat poverty, from BIPOC-created programs to evidence-based practices. And then we roll all of that into an index. And then we compare the index of what works to what the government is actually spending money on. Based on our audits, governments get a score and recommendations for equity-centered budgeting. And we've built these audits for a number of agencies like public schools, human services, parks and rec, police, but we're more than a software company. After the audit, we invite BIPOC community leadership to work with government officials to vet the measures, review the findings, and then co-create next steps together. We have run a successful pilot in Somerville Health Department um, we can also boast users from coast to coast, including the nation's largest regional education agency. And our newest client is a large school district in Sacramento, California, serving 40,000 students. So far, 30 government staff and legislators in 15 states have inquired about our software. But that is not enough. Because of our highly scalable solution, we can impact millions of Americans in every state. But we need your help. We would love introductions to government and other stakeholder partners and also help in navigating government procurement cycles. This is the team and together, we are working to make sure that my family story isn't the exception, but the rule. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Angela Jackson, Chief Ecosystem Investment Officer, Caper Enterprises. <laughs> Jeffrey Sire, CEO, Raven Indigenous Impact Foundation. And our moderator for this morning, Hala Hana, Managing Director, MIT Solve. Oh, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Welcome to day two of Solve at MIT. <laughs> Yay. You know, we do want Omolara's story to be the rule and not the exception. And this is some of the things that we're going to be talking about right now. For centuries in this country, black, indigenous, and people of color have demonstrated resilience and ingenuity in the face of entrenched injustice and inequity. And I'll be using the acronym BIPOC with an asterisk next to it for all of the nuances and cultures and identities that it may not capture necessarily. But we've just passed uh, the 700 day mark since George Floyd's death. 
And there's been calls and commitments to uh, do more, to close the race gap in outcomes and to increase um, racial equity. At Solve2, we've increased our attention and resources at home. We wanted to build on our Indigenous Communities Fellowship, which we started in 2017 after an invitation from the women tribal leaders of the Dakota Access Pipeline. So we've launched and we continue to launch US-focused challenges to find and support the most promising black and brown and indigenous innovators with partners and people like Angela uh, and Lynette from the Truist Foundation, whom you'll hear from later. And this year, we've added uh, black and brown innovators in the US program uh, to our global work to keep this focus. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what Solve is doing in, in the area, but obviously there's so much more that we all have to do uh, for the gaps to start closing faster. So in the next hour, we want to celebrate innovators like Omolara and like David, the artist that you're going to see after this panel, and with our speakers, uh, explore what more we can do to build that equitable, anti-racist future powered by technology that we all deserve. For our first panel, uh, we are going to focus on the gap in, in closing the gap in investing in communities of color. And Angela and Jeff, uh, you've both been advocates uh, for decades uh, for disenfranchised communities, and you have in recent years set up funds. Jeff, uh, Raven invests in indigenous communities in Canada, and Angela with KPOR, which invests in, in underrepresented communities writ large. So I really wanted to start with a pulse check on the state of investing in under-resourced innovators. Um, are we seeing more capital flowing? Is this, you know, is this uh, increase in attention just a m moment or is this really a movement? Do you feel like this is going to be something that sustains? Angela, we can start with you. So the way that I'm thinking about it now, after the death of George Floyd and the protests, there were $200 billion that were committed towards racial equity. When I looked at the last report from McKinsey, less than 20% of those dollars had actually been deployed. So there's lots of commitments. Um, what we're seeing is a flowing to like actually deploying those funds. And so we really need to think about that. And if you're taking a step back, a lot of the people who are deploying the funds are these corporations and they've been really opaque about how they're actually doing this work. And so you'll see those commitments have been over multi years, three years. It's really hard to, to track them. So the thing that I'm thinking about and what gives me hope in this moment is that we have citizen journalism. So there's people like Judd uh, Apatow, who's actually from uh, Popular Information. There's Sherelle Dorsey, who has a media called The Plug, and she's reporting on black innovation. It's really important that we keep these commitments to the forefront and that we hold corporations accountable for these commitments. And also, when I say accountable, that we're asking them to be transparent about these commitments. So what happened, what did they deploy in 2021? Mm -hmm. What was deployed in 2022? How many dollars are left? And I will say, I'm gonna you know, give a shout out to JP Morgan Chase because they're actually doing that. You can go on their website and they tell you how much that they've deployed towards their commitment. And what we need is from all corporations to have that same type of transparency. Thank you for that. And Jeff, you've also, you, we were just talking backstage about your experience with uh, indigenous communities in Canada and raising multiple funds right now. Yeah, so first of all, my apologies, I sound a bit like a jazz singer this morning. Um, I should introduce myself in a traditional way, Tan Shi, Kinu Kirune, Indigenous. Um, my name is, my, my English name is Jeff Sear. So we run Raven Indigenous Capital Partners and the Raven Foundation, and about four years ago now, we, we set up the first Indigenous Impact Investing Fund, and I can tell you it was an uphill battle. We were definitely pushing a boulder uphill with institutional and uh, high net worth family offices. The systemic racism was definitely there uh, because there were no Indigenous venture capital investors or fund managers such as ourselves out there. Um, and then, you know, sort of, a year and a half through that process of raising capital, I mean, we had some pretty brutal meetings, uh, to be honest. I mean, if, if I didn't come from MIT, Harvard, or Stanford, they didn't really want to talk to me. Um, eventually, we broke through the ceiling, though, and I think partially it goes to what was going on globally. In Canada, we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which kind of brought to public attention what had been going on with Indigenous people since colonization. And uh, we also had the Black Lives Matter movement, the DNI movement really broadly happening uh, across North America, and we invest in, in Canada and the United States. And so somewhere around, 
I don't know, about a year, year and a half ago, we saw a pivot um, where big institutional investors and capital was seeking a home for sure. And they were seeking a high social impact home where they could invest either directly or through fund managers into high impact um, businesses. Really is putting social impact, if I can use those terms broadly, at the forefront of what they wanted to see out of it and not really commercial returns. That is a pivot, a definite pivot going on in the ecosystem. You know, and, and to, to close off that sort of comment is we're raising fund two now, which is a $100 million fund, and uh, it is about 100 times easier than fund one. A, we have a track record, so that's easier. But B, institutional capital, um, we actually have to close our data room. There are too many people in, uh, interested. Uh, and where we really invest is the indigenous innovation ecosystem. So you can tell where people are going. Last comment, I know I'm taking too much time, is that um, thankfully what we're seeing out of our communities in Canada, the United States, across Turtle Island, is a huge amount of innovation coming from community. Oh. Tech, tech enabled, e-commerce businesses, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. so. And there's just a point I want to clarify. And I think, Jeff, you're right. There's a lot being deployed because of impact. And I'm with KPOR Center. Um, we invest with an impact lens, but we also want returns. We don't want the nar narrative to be when you're investing in black, Latinx, or indigenous communities that you're expecting concessionary returns. Mm -hmm. In those communities, there's the same genius, right? And they're solving problems for their communities. So our ethos is, Yes, we're going to get impact, but also we can expect returns. And so what I'd like to see investors think about is like beyond we're doing this because it's the moral thing to do or the charitable thing to do, really doing it in service of equity and in service of like efficiency. Mm -hmm. If you want a better return on your investment, uh, KPOR Capital, which is our early seed states fund for the last six years, we've been in the top quartile of funds and we're investing in both with that impact, but also looking for those market returns. Yeah, and just to add a little bit onto that is, um, we don't want charitable investing at all. That's not what we want. Uh, the businesses that we invest in, we see as best in class businesses, not best in indigenous, best in class uh, across the stream. Uh, so if someone wants to do it as a charitable thing, it's not really helpful to our communities to do that. Um, we prefer businesses who are interested in you know having that due diligence, these are you know, game-changing businesses on their own right, just to back up your point. Yeah. And maybe we can spend the rest of the next few moments actually unpacking what we mean by impact, what are the values behind it, what we mean by returns, you know, why, why are those folks actually best placed to bring those returns? And I'd love to anchor some of this conversation with uh, the, uh, you know, the concept of proximity and proximate entrepreneurs, which I think, Angela, you've coined and we've adopted at uh, Solve as one of the criteria that we look for. So I'd love to, uh, for you to talk a little bit about that and how it links to uh, actually making uh, good investments. Absolutely. So, you know, proximate entrepreneurs, and I've written a bit about this in Social Stanford Innovation Review, but really thinking about expertise and proximity as expertise. And so when we're looking at entrepreneurs, we want to understand when they're coming to us to invest in a solution, how that they've discovered this problem. Have they lived the problem that they're trying to solve? Do they have hard-won professional experience with the problem that they're trying to solve? And what we've seen is that those entrepreneurs actually have a nuanced understanding on one, why the problem hasn't been solved in the past, and two, what tweaks can be made so that it's more effective. And so just to give an example of that, um, there is one organization out there that I've written about called Girl Trek. Um, two African-American women who created this organization to get black women moving. And what was so interesting about this idea is that many entrepreneurs and many nonprofits had approached obesity in the black community with something as, you know, people just need to go on a diet. They just need to eat better. What they realized is that black women in community, that they really care about each other and they care about community. So when you bring them together around issues that are really important around health and having a conversation, what they can do is they will start a movement. And so what Girl Truck did is 
they have over a million black women walking in their neighborhoods. And what has happened as a consequence of that is that one, you've got, you know, health outcomes are improving, but two, you know when you get women together and we start seeing things in our neighborhood, they start fixing things. So mm -hmm. when they are walking down their streets and they see a pothole or they see a house that has been abandoned and has been abandoned for years, these women have come together to improve things in their community. So you see the double benefit. And they didn't approach it from, you know, problem size, these black women is just about their weight. It's really taken into account the other barriers that black women are facing, being disproportionately independent parents, mm -hmm. you know, having longer commutes, really understanding the problem from a, a system's way and coming up with a solution that only, not only helps these black women and their health, but also that helps their communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So proximity as a value, uh, the values that are behind uh, Raven Capital, I find also extremely uh, compelling and not traditional. I would love if you could talk a little bit about uh, them, Jeff. Sure. So we, you know, we sort of imbibe the seven sacred or seven grandfather teachings, depending on where you come from. Um, a lot of it has to do with respect and reciprocity and honor. And when we get into what we look for investments and get into, um, what you'll hear from us is we actually, we're not investing in you. We're becoming into a relationship with you. And we only take minority positions in companies. We always take seats on the board. And then we're there to help grow value in these businesses, but grow value in the way that those businesses want to with their community. Now, the first thing that we screen for is indigenous impact. We don't screen for commercial due diligence first. We screen for indigenous impact. We don't even want to talk to you if we can't see a direct line of sight between our, every dollar that we put in and the upliftment of our communities. And we have sort of fairly complicated measures to get uh, to get to that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're in a position where we think, you know, we're trying to undo colonization and trying to undo, you know, the way that Western economies work because it's not helping the vast majority of people. Fewer getting richer, more getting poorer. We all know these stories. Um, so we're trying to actually treat, and you'll probably find this term a little bit weird, we want um, money to act as medicine and love and not extraction, which it tends to do. So that's weird coming from a venture capitalist, I know. Um, but we, we want to keep money, keep resources, and what we call wealth, but that's human wealth, inside communities. We don't want to extract it like traditional venture capital tries to extract the wealth. You know, to become unicorns, 18 fail. That's not us. We want the tide to, to lift all boats. Um, so we're okay to give up some of those returns, how much money do we really all need at the end of the day, and um, have everyone uplift by it. So uh, it's a complicated uh, investment strategy, but it's uh, super rewarding, both as an investor, uh, for our investors who invest in us. I mean, we even created an Indigenous Impact Metrics Framework, mm -hmm. which tracks the United, Na the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in each portfolio company. So we can see where success is against the broader goals of indigenous people globally. Uh, so it's a different value system. Um, sometimes, you know, people on Wall Street or Bay Street in Canada kind of pat us on the head, say, that's nice, you know, we'll get those returns, but we're okay with that. That's not what we're here to do, so. Um, I would say that value is so important too because k Porter, we're very similar into having that commitment. And we have anyone that we invest in take a founder's commitment because we understand us requiring that or asking that is not enough in itself. We are really trying to have systems change. So we also want to invest in founders who are willing to make that commitment within, within their own organizations, right? Prioritizing expertise of the community, actually being in community with those communities, which is of critical importance. And you know, venture capital doesn't work for many people. And one thing that we're doing at K4 is we have dollars that we invest and we have, we're expecting venture capital returns. We have other dollars that we're like, we're fine like you. We can have a 3x or 4x return. And what we want to really get the message out to a lot of entrepreneurs is VC funding is not the North Star for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's OK to have a beautiful small business that benefits your community. And how do we open up capital flows that are not pressing entrepreneurs in ways that are also unhealthy for them? Right. I mean, and values alignment is incredibly important. I mean, as we said earlier in our earlier comments, there's a lot of capital looking for a home, but it has to be right aligned for your business. That's, your values have to be shared. Otherwise, that journey that you go, that growth journey together becomes very difficult along the way uh, if you're not aligned. And we even do this with our exit strategies. 
where we, at the front end, um, will structure a, a responsible exit where the management team or the company can buy our shares back at a fixed price now, not the fixed price then. And so you get this sort of what we call responsible exits out of businesses, which is hard to find. Like exiting is a tricky bit of business in venture capital. Um, and in our business, at least in the indigenous side, there are no natural follow-up. We're the only indigenous venture capital firm in North America. There are no natural follow-ons. So we have to be there to follow and to kind of work with them and mentor the founders when they go to a series B or a series C round to bring in the right sort of next stage investors. Otherwise, you're gonna undo what you've worked really hard to put into place. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hands-on work, it's time-consuming work, it works at a different pace, um, but it's extremely rewarding at the same time. I bet you don't hear that very often. <laughs> Money as healing, you know, take your time, be the size that you need to be and not more and not less. Uh, we have a lot of entrepreneurs here in the room, and I'm, I'm sure this is not what you usually hear from, uh, from VCs. So thank you for, for all of that and, and the permission to think differently. Um, and Jeff, you, there's also another novel financing mechanism that you've been working on recently that is around community outcome financing. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Because that also takes it, you know, uh, we've been talking about the entrepreneur, and now this is about like investing in, you know, the community at large coming together to do this work. Right, so the way, if you think of a theory of change, for example, the way that we looked at it at Raven is we can have impact through these businesses into communities. Um, it's a certain type of impact. But at a community level, um, it, it's like the initiative you talked about, you're looking for a different sort of impact and the problems are often more complex to solve. So we use outcomes-based financing or pay for performance financing. You raise upfront capital, usually it's a government uh, who pays for the performance and the success on it. We're doing uh, a lot of work in clean energy in on-reserve communities and in type two diabetes reduction. And type two is actually probably more interesting than clean energy because it's so complex and it's such a massive healthcare cost driver. Uh, it is fundamentally one of the biggest uh, drivers for bad outcomes during the COVID pandemic. It's bad outcomes on everything. And in indigenous communities, uh, as in a lot of minority communities, type two diabetes is at like three to five times the normal population. So it's killing our people slowly. So we, we needed a, a different mechanism, a different way of looking at it. And so what we do is we dig deep in community and work with them to create the set of interventions. So we're not imposing it. The elders and, and the, the youth and community and others are saying, this is what we need because we're closest to the problem and we know how to solve it. And then we go after that and find the money. We don't start with the money. That, that's the wrong way to start. That's how uh, some of the social finance stuff has started to date and it hasn't worked that well. So we need the community to own the initiative, own the interventions, we'll find the resources to make it happen. And we, we call them Indigenous Solutions Lab, you can call them whatever you want, where we kind of lab the ideas together, uh, usually over a nine to 12 month period, create the interventions that they own and, and it's starting to have a lot of success. And we're really excited about where it's going. I thought you wanted to say something. <laughs> Uh, because that, that's also very, I mean, the, the, the values that we've been talking about is something that you've been, uh, you know, pushing for with KPOR. Uh, and there is, there's been a recent report about also the, the, uh, where things are at right now and some of the stories that have come up. Um, is there something that resonates from what we've been saying about you know, this kind of uh, investment? Well, there's a couple of things, a couple of thoughts. One is to the entrepreneurs that are in a room, I think that there's an opportunity, right? And we have this entrepreneur in our portfolio. It's called Kai VR, um, Kai Frazier. And she said, you know, we get to choose who we make rich, you know? And you all have the ideas. I mean, innovation is really the capital that's out there, right? That all investors who want to make a return, we're looking for innovators who have a nuanced view to a, a broad problem. So just remember when you're entering these conversations, you're evaluating them just like they're evaluating the, you, and you get to decide who you want at your cap table. And to your point, it absolutely matters. And it matters most in times like what's happening now. You know, there's a lot of talk around recessions. Um, there is a lot of talk about inflation. And so a lot of startup entrepreneurs are really making hard choices to save capital right now. So they'll be deciding, you know, do we stop hiring? Do we let some of the staff go? 
And if you're not values aligned, if you don't have values aligned investors at your cap table, they may be pushing you to treat your human capital in a way that doesn't align with your own values. And so what do you do then? And what we've been able to bring to the table as K4 Capital is that we've been that board seat and that board member who can help hold the line to remind that entrepreneur what their values were when they started. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we, we have had returns. So we're on to our third fund for K4 Capital Three. Um, in addition to that, you know, we've invested in fund managers. Mm -hmm. um, we've had top quartile returns on that. So the big thing that I just want to keep hitting um, on is that this is just the right thing to do for your business. Mm -hmm. And really thinking about values alignment, you know, we're seeing, as you said, Jeff, more people who are looking to deploy their capital this way. We're looking at new laws with the SEC and they're asking companies to report on their human capital. This is the way the world is moving. Those who are not working this way will be left behind. Mm -hmm. They will not have the returns in the future that we'll see. They'll be seen as extractive. And I think customers, consumers, will begin you know, voting with their own dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple comments if yes, I please. could. Um, yeah, if you're an entrepreneur in the room and, and you're seeking capital, you're doing as much due diligence on the capital provider as they're doing on you. You wanna make sure you know where their money is coming from and what they see as important and how they treat of, treated previous entrepreneurs. In fact, I would phone previous founders and say, how, did, how was it uh, working with them? We get that a lot, we appreciate that. I think that's a, a good thing to do. The other thing I would say to entrepreneurs, well, yeah, the other thing I'd say to entrepreneurs is that um, when, uh, when you're, as a venture capitalist, what I'm seeking, whatever, no, no matter what people tell you, it's character-based investing. You're investing in people. Great ideas are great, but I want to know who the person is behind it. What's the story? What's your story? What motivates you? What makes you move? Because those are, I t I trust me, those are long hours you're about to put in into your ventures. Um, and I think, you know, what I want to hear is your story and who you are as a person. That's really what I want to invest in. Um, <laughs> the other thing, you know, that, that occurred to me is what more and more investors are seeking is for you to tell your impact story. What's your impact narrative? Um, that's a, we are now helping to coach some of the businesses through an impact narrative, which we're fine with. Um, <clears throat> how are you having impact on people's lives? Uh, how are you changing it? What's your theory of change uh, behind it? Um, these are really critical things. Uh, that we now seek as an investor. And I, I think broadly what you're seeing in the sort of institutional investing and private capital system is a pivot towards, I think pretty soon everyone will be doing impact investing. I, I just, it's unavoidable. This is the way that it's going. It's like early talks about ESG, which I don't like. I think it's a negative risk screen. What we need is a positive intentionality screen, which is what we seek in business. What's your positive intention? And it just, you know, that's where the fun stuff is too, right? You get to work with people in that way. It's just adding into no, your thing. I love what you said about that. And I think as entrepreneurs, you know, really coming up with how you measure that and how you articulate that and how you build a case is really important because impact can be nebulous, but really doing the work. And I say it's almost like the wild, wild west now because like everyone is coming up with their own kind of lens on what impact looks like. And so I think it's really important for entrepreneurs to really think about their theory of change what impact looks like, you know, really in dotting line that to like, and what are the dollars saved? What is the impact on the wealth gap? There's things that you can do to also teach investors because a lot of investors are early in their own journeys around measurement like that. And there's, there's not one set measurement that we can go after. At k Center Investments, which I lead, we came up with the criteria and we actually did the work and talked about, you know, these are our five Im impact investing criteria. This is how we measure them. This is the evidence that we'd want to see from entrepreneurs. But when I talk to peers in VC, a lot of them haven't done that work as it relates to impact. They have it on returns, but as it means impact on actual human lives, we haven't seen that. So I think that's an opportunity also to show your expertise when you're in front of uh, a funder and really starting to speak their language, but also really being detailed about what that input looks like. Yeah, d two comments on that. One, no one pays for impact. So it, it, impact measurement. So it's good to build it into your business uh, as into the DNA of the business uh, at the beginning. 
uh, so that you're collecting data as you go along. Data becomes really important in this. We as well created our own indigenous impact measurement framework based on, you know, we use traditional storytelling, we use traditional mechanisms to, uh, to do this. Um, and I want to make one more comment on the market. Um, interesting during the pandemic, because we were running our first fund through it, is what we saw in sort of businesses that were the kind, the high impact businesses, is they, were, they got non-correlated market returns. So as the market was pivoting in negative directions, these businesses were actually doing really well. Um, they had a sort of certain amount of resiliency in them because they're based deep in their communities. Uh, that was, trust me, we didn't know going into it. We found as we were coming out of it that that's the way that it was. So it was really exciting to see these non-correlated market returns by investing in, um, and I'm happy to say 60% of our portfolio is, is uh, women-led. Um, they're all indigenous, so we're in that space of what we call the impact alpha, where we're getting both diversity and inclusion and, and all these things happening at the same time with the businesses, which is really, really exciting. Um, but this non-correlated market returns because of the resiliency is really important in the long term for fund managers as we're, you know, or, or as investment funds looking to build out um, uh, portfolios. The other thing I wanted to say, you know, people think investing in the indigenous ecosystem, what does that really mean? Our portfolio, it strangely, as though we are sec sector agnostic, is primarily tech and tech enabled and e-commerce enabled as it turns out. Um, there are some which is high value products from the land and the sea based on traditional knowledge moving into other spaces, but it, it's, we didn't know. We were sector agnostic going in, and that's, that's how it turned out. That's terrific. So for if there's too much to even try to summarize, I think we've given a lot of advice to entrepreneurs in terms of, first of all, you're changing who has the right to fail. You're cha you know, if, if there are some people who, have, who were born with you know, failure being this uh, thing to celebrate, and then others who have been just given that right and now are able to go run with it and try things out. Um, and, and so for entrepreneurs, measuring what matters, uh, doing the due diligence both ways, um, uh, building the internal capacity to be experts in those things, uh, those are really, really helpful uh, uh, pointers. And for investors, all I have to say is beware because impact investing is the only investing, uh, uh, you know, sometime down the line, hopefully, hopefully soon. And also for all of us to be pushing for transparency on those disbursements and, uh, and those promises that have been made. Anything else that you would like to add uh, in the two minutes that we have left? Yeah, I think just really quickly, uh, we did a report at KPOR on the uh, state of the black tech ecosystem. And one thing that we think about as other investors is VC investors, 61% of them after George Floyd said that they wanted to deploy more of their dollars into black, Latinx, and brown founders, 61%. So the intent is there. And I always believe, you know, maybe I'm Pollyanna, that people do have the best intentions. But we also need to acknowledge as investors what are our blind spots. You know, we do reps and we invest based on pattern recognition, right? And so because of that, you may have a certain type of founder who has a certain type of business that you've invested in. And actually, we've been rewarded for that because you've gotten returns. And so I think the challenge for us is to push against that especially and ask ourselves questions when we're seeing a founder that might not fit that pattern to take a step back and a, a pause and ask why. Is it because of their idea? Is it because of their identity? Is it because you don't have familiarity with their community? And I think that that will help us as investors close the gap between our stated outcomes and our intentions and then the reality of where we're deploying the dollars. Because I just think, again, investors are always looking for a good deal. It's these unconscious things that are happening Right. That again, that have served us really well, that won't serve us as we think about moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that's an, an excellent comment. I, I don't know if I can add much to it except to say that what I see out there is perceived risk in to invest into, you know, BIPOC, the BIPOC community. Um, I'm not in love with the word BIPOC, but it kind of describes uh, what we're talking about here. Most investors are either, you know, afraid don't understand, and so they, they put this as perceived risk. And this is for the capital, as well as people who do direct investing. And um, what we've found through studies and reports like yours is that it's actually opposite. I know we did a study in Canada, and 
found that the repayment rate on loans for Indigenous people was at like 98.9%, something like that. It was way higher than the mainstream population. Uh, so it's just not true. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, dealing, we're breaking down those barriers about perceived risk on all sides is really important. Well, Jeff, Angela, thank you so much for all of this insight. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I'll see you in a little bit after this presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Please welcome multidisciplinary artist David Alabo. Um, it's an incredible honor to be here in front of you all, and I'm so grateful to be able to share my story with you. My name is David Alabo, and I'm an Afrofuturist digital artist. And, and I employ a, a variety of mediums. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I employ a variety of mediums uh, using stuff like computer generated programming, virtual reality, and even a little bit of artificial intelligence to create the works that you see behind me. Um, I build colorful and fantastical worlds that put black people in the spotlight and show them in positions of empowerment and strength. Now, why do I do this? Because I believe that everyone, and especially people that look like me, need art that not only transports them to a new reality or future, but also provides a sort of meditative healing, not an escape, from a world that demands so much from us and gives us so little in return. Before I move on to talk about this movement that I'm a part of, let me just give you a little bit about myself, a little bit of background. Uh, so my mother is Moroccan and my father is Ghanaian. So I've kind of grown up with a very interesting blend of uh, West African and North African heritage. And I'm yet to meet another Ghanaian Moroccan, so <laughs> if it's out there, you know, holler at me. <laughs> um, but on top of that, my father was a diplomat, which meant that we as a family, we were always moving around and having to assimilate to so many different cultures, whether it was in Ghana, Morocco, India, Russia, or even Italy, where I was born, when my dad was serving there. Now, I promise you this is not a geography lesson. I'm not bragging about where I've been. But what I'm trying to say is that I've been blessed enough to have sort of a unique perspective as a human being, and more importantly, as a black person, uh, navigating this sort of weird and often complicated place we call Earth. And now what I wanted to talk with you today about is sort of the speculative power of Afrofuturism and its sort of potential to create a future that is truly inclusive and representative of all of us. Now, what is Afrofuturism and why is it important? Well. Afrofuturism powerfully imagines elsewhere, beyond our present alienation. Our work is rooted in the desire to transform the present for black people. To do so, we imagine a reality in which we are agents of our own story, countering histories that have often dismissed our contributions, or even worse, erased us from them entirely. And I often get asked, like, how do I come up with like, my what, what are my inspirations for my art and how do I get these kind of ideas? And usually the answer is quite simple. Like the very nature sometimes of being a black person in this world is surreal. So I draw from my experiences growing up, you know, when I've often, you know, felt quite isolated or alienated and sometimes displaced. And these themes are often quite like prevalent in my work and also in other uh, kind of pioneering Afrofuturists. And it's something we can sort of relate to all as a collective, right? But the, the work of imagining alternate futures is also about imagining alternate pasts. Pasts in which black and indigenous people feature as more than just passive observers. It's about rewriting the narrative on agency and action, and it can often be political. This desire to uncover the past is increasingly necessary today, particularly as a means of challenging the systems of capitalism and exploitation today. 
This idea of an elsewhere represents possible histories as possible futures. What could have been, you know? Personally, for me, I like to push that definition even further. And, you know, I, I try to bring it down to how we create and, like, subsequently consume art these days and what that means for the future. As an artist, I find myself constantly asking, like, what can I, what tools or what tech can I use around me to kind of push the boundaries of art? And if those don't exist, how can we build them, right? Like, I feel like I'm in the right building here to, <laughs> to be asking those questions, right? Um, but what kind of separates your typical futurist from an Afrofuturist is that we not only ask ourselves, what are we building for the future, but we ask, who is building them? And for whom is it being built for? Which I think is a very important distinction to make. You know? So last year in November, I was invited to kind of create a uh, sort of video installation, like the one we have out in the, lou in the lounge. And, um, I watched for like three days as people were coming, going and coming and sort of responding to the work. And I was like kind of um, taking that all in. And what I found so fascinating was that like children, like let's say below the age of 12, where their, their response to the art was completely different. Whereas like, like people like us, the adults or whatever, would come in and ask kind of these artsy questions like what's the context of this and all of that. The kids were like jumping, they were like running around, taking like selfies, recording each other in front of the display. And you know, they were more than just observers, you know, they were active participants in the art, you know, which kind of like changed the way I was seeing um, the purpose of the art I was making, you know. And maybe they were just kids being kids, you know, but it really opened my eyes to that importance of the work because it showed that. You know, even though the way we create art is rapidly evolving, you know, the tools that we use and all are changing so fast, the way we consume art is changing at an even faster rate, you know? So that's something that I feel like is often overlooked and that we should keep in mind, you know? And that's why I feel like it's so important that black and indigenous people are not only active consumers of technology, but are also playing a pivotal role in its construction and evolution. You know, so after kind of all the buzz from the fair was done, the storm had settled. I noticed a boy sitting there and he'd been sitting next to his mother for about 45 minutes and was just glued onto the screen, you know, and he was wearing these big headphones and I was curious, obviously, I wanted to ask what was up. So the mother kind of pulled me aside and told me that like her son was actually diagnosed with a severe case of autism and that this was the only work out of the entire giant art fair that he felt comfortable enough to watch and kind of absorb, you know? And that was like obviously an incredibly humbling experience for me because, you know, even though I put, it was obviously, a, sorry, an incredibly humbling experience, you know, but it kind of showed me that the purpose of my work is to obviously allow people to feel empowered and find strength in the work, you know? just like that little boy did, you know, and to everybody who maybe ever felt isolated, alienated, or displaced can find strength and power through the work I was creating, you know. And now you can imagine how silly I felt after, like, wondering what, what he was doing uh, with the headphones, you know. But like I've said before, I want, I, want it, I want my work to create not only empowerment, but also allow people to have time to have meditative healing and to feel peace and strength through the work I do, you know? So we need to imagine futures beyond the continuous reinfliction of the wounds of our past, you know? I feel like, you know, it's so powerful when you can see a black person thriving in a sort of unexplored place, you know? There's great power in reimagining new realities and it's up to us to be at the forefront of, you know, technological innovation in combination with art and science to provide hope in a time when I feel like we need it the most. Thank you for listening. Please welcome Lynette Bell,
President, Truist Foundation. Caesar McDowell, Professor of the Practice, Civic Design, MIT. And our moderator for the panel, Hala Hana. That was amazing. <laughs> Talk about the power of imagination and the importance of imagining our future. And you know, it's like thinking of art as this, the, the, the collective memory of humanity and the, and the uh, thanking those who have come before us for, for the inspiration. And when we, I mean, art is such a tenet of all of that and such a tenet of, uh, of what makes us feel like a community. Uh, I really want us to kind of bring some of that, um, you know, dreamlike, uh, uh, hope for the future into this conversation. And starting maybe with, uh, with you, Caesar, because your work is so much on defining what makes a community engage, how to do that actually meaningfully, and how to put the, uh, the uh, ability to create a future into the community's hands. Oh, hi, Harlow, thank you. Uh, and it's good to be here. Uh, it's great to be here with Annette. Uh, I guess to me, I, what I want to say about that question is that we have to start by recognizing where we are, right? Uh, a lot of our work right now is just looking at and understanding the ways in which we are disconnected in this society. We spend a lot of time talking about it in terms of polarization around political ideas, but I want us to think about it another way, which is that our disconnections that we're seeing don't just exist around these fault lines like politics and stuff. They actually exist both within ourselves, because we're dealing with the contradictions of who we are, what we believe and the different ways we believe, and within the people who are in our communities. And what we've been working on and what our work is really about is how do we kind of go back to what we've always known and what every culture has done, which is find the possibilities and create the spaces for people in small conversations to actually know and understand the way each other is experiencing the world. All right. So I think this notion of stepping into the future uh, as far as David said, it's also about understanding the space in which you are and being able to see that and being able to see that with each other. And so a lot of the work that we're doing here is to figure out not just how can we have those small conversations, but how can we build the technology that actually supports the sharing of those experiences across these conversations, be it in the city, across the world, and across different ways of viewing. So I think the imagination starts with the recognition and the listening and the knowing of what our experience is and those of others. Mm. Thank you, Caesar. Uh, Lynette, hi. Hi. Uh, you, your work at the Tourist Foundation, which you set up right as things were falling apart <laughs> uh, in, in the spring of 2020, um, also focuses on investing in, in nonprofits to make sure that they can support uh, small businesses in communities that are uh, disenfranchised and in need of uh, technology that works better for them. Please tell us more about that work. Yeah, thank you, Hala. Really great to be here, and thanks, Caesar. Um, the work at the Truist Foundation, as Hala stated, we <laughs> started the Truist Foundation right, it felt like six weeks before the pandemic happened. And we were taking two former legacy financial institutions and merging them together. As part of the merger, one of the things that we knew we had to work on was supporting small businesses. The pandemic really unraveled a lot around our economy, particularly as you looked at small businesses, and even harshly, more harshly so for minority-owned businesses or BIPOC businesses. And so at the Truist Foundation, we were like, how can we support and really create the investment vehicle so that businesses not only can recalibrate their models during such a critical time, but also be resilient after this has happened or after this has passed. And, you know, we were talking with the CDC Foundation as the pandemic came on board, and they were like, this is going to have a really long tail. And I would have put $1,000 against that and saying that's not going to happen. But what we noticed was that exactly right. It started, and it was a slow trickle. And so businesses really had to recalibrate. And one of the things that we did was invest in small businesses in a way under our Truist Cares program, we provided $50 million during the pandemic to really address those critical needs so that businesses not only could help rebound, but also be resilient post this happening. And a lot of the companies had the ability to change their operating model. You know, the models were more face-to-face, -face, and so now we all had to go into this virtual cave 
they, they started recalibrating that model. And so we worked with other nonprofit companies like TechSoup, who provided a lot of the technology platform for them to start and change and recalibrate their models. So for us at the foundation, it's about how do we help provide that infrastructure to those businesses right, indirectly through nonprofits, because we're an endowed foundation, so we don't give directly to individuals or businesses, we give to nonprofit entities, right, that help small businesses. And we really focus on those who have a mission and drive around that. We work with a lot of community development financial institutions um, to help support that. And one that we just gave a recent grant to was Grimmy in America. We provided $1.5 million to help women-owned businesses, i.e. African-American women businesses. The dollars we provided is part of a wraparound 360 supportive services that are technical support for those business owners, but also creating that growth and sustainability that they need with a loan fund and, or a grant. And so we know that finding those relationships that are already doing this really impactful work is really critical. We know Grameen, our little small investment in them, is part of a $1.3 billion investment, and they're gonna impact 80,000 black women business owners. That's wonderful. For the audience, I am going to come to you for questions and answers, so we're going to get that chance. Uh, so as you're hearing the panel speak, do think of uh, what you may want to ask them for, for the second half of our conversation. Uh, so Caesar, you've been talking about building technology that supports the future that we want to build. Tell me more what that looks like. I mean, especially, obviously, I'm thinking of the world that we're living in right now and the news that we're hearing and how, uh, you know, billionaires used to buy newspapers and uh, today billionaires are buying Twitter. Uh, and, you know, what, what that means, because also when we're talking about having conversations, we're talking about where, where is the public square where we have those conversations. Is it a public square or is it actually a gamified conversation uh, that is being monetized by a corporation? Well, I hope it's not the latter. Uh, I hope we, uh, we can do something uh, a lot different. So one part of answering that question is for us to deconstruct what it is uh, we think is going on right now. One of the problems we have, one of the things we're struggling with is that we are actually building our kind of civic tech, our technologies, to create us together on the same kind of principles that actually we started this country with. And those foundational principles were about exclusion. They were about who could participate and who couldn't. And what we've done over the years is kept trying to modify that to make it a little bit more inclusive and a little bit more inclusive. And then we come along with the kind of tech side and say, oh, technology has something to add to this. And what it does is steps into those same frameworks. And I'll give you an example of that. Right now, when people talk about the town square, things like that, they talk about putting together a meeting uh, to bring the community together. They use this term really about the town hall, right? right? But that vision, right? This is why I love what David was talking about. You know, we need to really imagine new things, right? Because that notion of what the town hall actually comes out of a practice here in New England right, that actually came from communities that basically were people who share the same religion. They were open mostly to men to talk. And so they created an environment that would allow them to come to judgment together. That is not the communities we live in today. Right now, we're living among the most demographically complex set of people who've ever lived together in places. And so what we have to do is start to reimagine what does it mean for us to come together and how to create those spaces. Our technology today, our social media, is basically set up to support talk, right? It's there for people to express. So therefore, when we hear about Twitter wanting, you know, the, the change in Twitter that Musk is going to do is basically say, I'm going to enable more free speech. Free speech in and of itself does not build our collective ability to move. What does is dialogue. What we need is not more talk platform, social media platforms, we need to start to think about how do we build social dialogue platforms, spaces that create the opportunities and build the, op you know, the places where people feel they can step in in a trustful relationship with people, share what they can, not what they don't want to, and actually collect that, uh, yeah, and be able to collect and share that. I can go into that a lot more, but I think this is the fundamental thing, is that we are in a new space where we need to step 
into imagining something very different. And imagine it based on a knowledge and an understanding of what we're sitting on, what's working there, what's broken there. Imagine something different and then start to build technologies that actually enable that. And, and if the starting point of democracy is participation, then digital equity becomes all the more important. And I, I was seeing that the, a, Tr a Truist Foundation focuses a lot on this. Can you tell us why it matters for the communities where you work and, and how you uh, lever leverage that to close some of the gaps, both social, economic, and political? Yeah, I love that um, Caesar talked about social dialogue. One of the things that we started once we merged two institutions together, started having those dialogues with communities because we were ever present and on the ground with them. It, it is important to listen to communities versus flying above at 10,000 feet and saying, I know what the solution is. We really believe in listening. So we hosted listening sessions around the country with some of our community-based organizations and nonprofits to figure out where's the right space for us as we built the Truist Foundation and went into what does the strategy look like to balance equity or to build investments in a way that shows real impact? And so we <laughs> narrowed it down to two strategic pillars, strengthening small businesses and career pathways to economic mobility based on those social dialogues we had with community-based organizations and nonprofits. So that was our opportunity to really listen and be impactful. And so when we thought about equity with the pandemic and we learned so much from the pandemic and then we had the racial justice movement, what we've done at the Truist Foundation is to ensure that we provide in this new inclusive model equity. And that equity means, hey, nonprofit, who is your constituent that you're driving impact around? Because the first thing a funder wants to know is what impact do you have? So I want to make sure your impact is diverse, serving multiple communities. But more importantly, who's on your board of directors? How diverse is your board? How diverse is your senior leadership as a nonprofit organization? We're diving a little bit deeper. It's not just for our constituents who receive the investment, but when I work with vendors or third-party consultants, how diverse is your team? How diverse is your senior leadership? That's really, really important for us. If we're talking about how we embed equity into not only the investment process for recipients, but also in the operation of our foundation, that's really critical. And I'll add one more thing. As an endowed foundation, we make investments to grow the capital of that endowment. We are using the same platform of asking where are the diversified managers? Mm -hmm. How do we diversify our portfolio so that this equity stream that we're talking about is consistently embedded in everything we do? That's Thank you for, for that. It's like diving a lot deeper and going many, many layers deeper into what, what means uh, to uh, remove bias from our decision uh, making. And maybe that's, that's one place where, uh, Caesar, I'd love your thoughts because we, we've been talking a lot about, and especially here at MIT, about the, the uh, biases that are being baked into the technology that we're using today. And my understanding is that you know, the, the bias becomes inherent for three reasons. First, uh, the starting point of which data are we even collecting? Who are we asking the questions? Who are we having the conversations mm -hmm. with, as Lynette was saying? Uh, the second is the uh, who's writing the algorithm, especially when you know where we've been isn't necessarily where we want to go. Sure. Um, and then the product also, of course, who's designing it? I remember um, you know, uh, having a health app on my phone that uh, tracked my copper intake, but not my periods. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, there's, we, we tend to uh, think in sometimes techno-deterministic terms, you know, if, if, if only we had that feature and then, you know, things would be fixed, but it's actually, um, it, it's, it's not that. There are so many steps before. Can you speak a little bit to that and to how you're seeing uh, tech correct, or how you're seeing us correcting for some of these biases in the tech? Well. Yeah, so one reason I raised this issue about the social dialogue platform is one of the things that we're trying to deal with in, in the center that we have. Uh, two different things we're looking at. One is a, uh, a social dialogue platform for, uh, for uh, teenagers, middle school age kids. Another one that really supports things that's going on in communities. But the interesting thing about building that technology is our goal is not we, we can't look at the issue of how rapidly can we scale. This is one of the things that happens with technology companies a lot. It's about scaling and scaling quickly, right? What we've really realized is that we have to match the development of our technology, technology with our understanding of how people grapple with the technology and the issues they're to solve. 
So I'll give you a couple of examples. We've, uh, we ran a project in Boston around the new mayoral election that happened. It was historic, the first person of color ever to be elected a mayor in the city of Boston. Uh, talking about progress, we're pretty slow here in New England around some things, and that's one of them. But uh, we did all these small scale dialogues, right, uh, that we were able to record, transcribe, actually uh, have those uh, audio clips be used and shared and coded and shared across different conversations. And in building the technology to do that, it all sounded really good. We knew we made good progress on it, but we also ran up across this problem, which is our ability to do it in English was one thing. Our ability to do it with another language was a problem. And yet we're talking about building a tool that's actually about stitching together a complex public. So here's one of the things that I think that gets in the way of technologists and the buy stuff is we are not humble enough about what we're actually able to do with the tools that we built. Right? We have not enough humility to say, like, this is only really good for this thing over here. Right? And this becomes a problem. Right? You know, I would have loved to have been on the other panel to answer this question, but I can ask you, you know, we can talk about this together. It's like, how does like the, the notion of humility and investment go together? Right? Mm -hmm. How do you keep someone who's trying to build something to be humble in what they're building and creating? And then how do investors really then, you know, honor that and stay with that so that the thing that people are creating, and particularly in technology, does not outrun, right? The technology does not outpace and outrun actually the, what I would call a just implementation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's another value piece, Lina. Yeah, I, that's a really valid point. I think you're right. The ability to be humble is raw, but the, the need to drive to scale feels very paramount to a lot of sectors of business, particularly in the financial services industry. You know, a bank is all about how do we drive scale so that we can hit the exponential rate of X, right, for that client. And so when we think about the impact investing we want to see, I still am mostly concerned about who are we serving and who's going to be affected either positively or negatively by that kind of technology play. Plus, the technology play is solving a critical issue, but it still has to be connected to the culture and the community that we're trying to build the new solution for. I love technology, and I think that, yeah, the quicker and faster it can go, great, but can we keep abreast so that we don't lose the values that communities need to thrive yeah. as part of that? Thank you for that. I did promise Q&A, so I, I think we should get to that in the, in the next 10 minutes. Uh, there are mics going around, so you can please raise your hand and my colleagues will come to you with a mic and we'll, take, we'll try to take two or three in a row and then have them answered uh, by Caesar and Lynette. Uh, my name is Nelima. I'm from the Female Founders Lab and really looking at like what does industry transformation look like? And so um, you're talking a lot about, you know, the digital revolution and the way that inclusion, you know, hasn't ever been there and is continuing not to be there. And I would really love to look at it from the lens of when you say inclusion, you're assuming there's a central figure, like I am the one including more and more and more, like to the edge of the room. But what if we looked at decentralization so that everybody is sovereign and everyone <clears throat> has their own self like centering? And like what would that look like for technology as well as like investment and like community solutions? Thank you. Uh, we're gonna take one more. Thank you for that. I saw there are hands here. Oh, and there, sorry, yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rebecca Obunu, and I work at the PKG Public Service Center at, um, here at MIT, and I have a question. Uh, as, as I was listening to the discourse about uh, uh, biases and trying to remove biases in tech, and I thought, but we all have biases. Can we really remove biases, or is it that we can counter balance each other's biases by having diversity. That was a, something I wanted to just pose, pose or um, ask as a question. Thank you, Rebecca. 
uh, Caesar, Lynette, so we have a question about decentralization and a question about how to, you know, what's the most effective way to uh, mitigate biases? Well, I, I would say that the, the most effective way to mitigate bias is to actually be clear and transparent about it. This is the biggest problem, it's the lack of transparency. Uh, I think it goes to the issue of being humble, to be able to say, like, we know this thing that we've created works only under these kinds of conditions, uh, and knowing that, and then being able to have a lot more kind of uh, open source opportunities for people then to adjust and add and create and modify things so that they actually work uh, for a much broader population or certain situation. Uh, transparency is our big, you know, I think one of our biggest problems uh, in this society. We just, you know, we keep things closed. That's the way businesses run. That's the way, you know, patents run. A whole set of things are built around the notion of not having that. The extent we can have more of that, uh, I think we're better off that way. And just the last, the, the, the first question, uh, just even in the work we were doing as I was talking about the work in Boston, one of the things we tried, tried to work on, <laughs> we haven't got any solution to it yet, but we're really working with a number of community partners around this is, in these small conversations when people are talking, and then we're able to call and collect up the experiences they shared that a particular person has, Building a system that allows them to be forever the owner of that piece of information, wherever it travels, so that they can be the one to decide who gets to hear it, what becomes public, when it does and doesn't. And uh, this is not a solved problem. It's a distributed problem, right? It's basically saying this knowledge belongs to this person. They want to set up a system in their community with people that they trust, so they can be a, what we call these kind of data trustees in the community that folks are willing to give a proxy to, to share certain kinds of information. Uh, so I think there are things that we can start to do, and there's technology that's coming around that's supporting us to have much more distributed mechanisms and systems about how we actually build knowledge and create value. Mm. Uh, the thing I will add is that as a financial institution, you know, we have a lot of AI, artificial intelligence, we have a lot of scoring models that uses data. And to remove the biases, you know, because we're so heavily regulated as a bank, that every regulator, regardless of the chart of the bank, comes in and looks at those scoring models, looks at the data you're collecting to create the assessment to say, you know, HALA gets a loan or HALA does not get a loan at the financial institution. So there's risk components tied to bodies of, uh, of institutions that have to comply. You know, some of the languages has to be empirically derived and statistically sound. That is part of the risk components that a financial institution who takes your deposits in has to be responsible for and being a good steward of the data, but also of the scoring models they use to make credit worthy decisions. The same thing applies from the investment side of the house as well. You know, it's not just about the debt and equity that a bank provides, but it's also about the investments they do. So all of that is under the risk profile and has to be assessed. We're assessed, it feels like a regulator's in every six months, but it probably is every year but a bank is assessed on that. So please know that anything we build around technology using our Scrum and Agile teams, we have a great technology center in Charlotte that the Agile and Scrum teams have this really unique playground they're in. They got baseballs and they got ping pong balls and they just have a different environment to work in because they're trying to be agile and responsive to what's happening in the technology space. But please know that we're heavily regulated on how those models are created. That's very interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Questions? Can we take the question from, from this side? Thank you. Caesar and Lynette, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives um, on social dialogue in particular. I'm wondering, in the age of filter bubbles and, and social media where people aren't necessarily their, their best selves um, when they're typing from behind a screen, do you see social dialogue happening uh, at scale online on social media? And if you see that conversation happening in a meaningful way, way at scale, uh, what do we need to do to get there? So uh, most of the tools that people use aren't there to support dialogue. Okay. So there are not very many places you can look online and say these things can scale. Right. I also think we need, to, we need to be careful about what we mean by scale uh, in, in, a, in a social dialogue. Um, we need to get things right you know, where we are and where we live. 
And I think we need to start thinking about our technology, not how does it support something that actually can happen and grow, you know, no matter where you are, but something that can grow and support a community that's in a place that's trying to be in relationship with each other, right? We've disembodied our dialogue, right? Which means we've connected it away from the experience in a lot of ways. We need to kind of actually re-embody it, right? And get it connected to who we are, to our physical being in the world, and our presence. And we need to use the technology to augment that, right? To help that and to support that. Not to actually allow us to escape from it, right? Because when we escape from our, who we are embodied, we're basically escaping from ourselves to be human to each other. Right? And so for me, the notion is not the scale uh, in a broad sense, but is how within a particular locale or community of stuff do we create and use op, you know, the technology that helps us connect as human beings one to one to each other. I have this great quote from a friend of mine, so I'll say it real quick, I see the clock running, about community. And he says this, look, community exists when people who are interdependent, can peacefully struggle with traditions that bind them and interests that separate them so that they can realize a future that's an equitable improvement on the past. And what this says is that what we should be doing with our social dialogue and our technology is using it to build the spaces in which that peaceful struggle can happen. That's what we need. And that's not gonna happen at the scale of a nation. It's going to happen at the scale of a neighborhood, at the scale of a unit in an organization, at the scale of a company. And if we do that and repeat it over and over and over again, we can learn then how to be in dialogue and relationship with each other. A note to the metaverse, <laughs> as we're about to build it. <laughs> uh, thank you. This is a wonderful note to uh, end on. But Lynette, if you want to uh, say something else, I want to make sure we, we get yeah. to hear it too. I think Caesar's right on. It's about connectivity in communities. And so there is no platform. Because if you think about social media, there is no social dialogue happening. Because everything is a 30 second or 15 second note. And so the dialogue happens when you really build that connectivity and community and go to those partners who are really trying to impact and change the ecosystems that exist that are fractured or fragmented. And that connectivity is done community to community, person to person. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this panel. I, I do want to wrap our plenary because we've heard from uh, Omolara, Jeff, Angela, David, Lynette, and Caesar. And, uh, and it's all about how do we build communities uh, that, are, that are more like us and that are, that where everyone has the same uh, opportunity. Uh, you know, I, I'm a recent immigrant to this country and the American dream has been very generous to me. And I'm conscious of the particular roadblocks that my fellow Americans face who have been here since the dawn of time or whose ancestors have come here forcefully on boats or whose families crossed uh, the border by foot. And so here's paying respect, as David said, to all those who came before us. Uh, making this dream a reality really should not be up to luck, as Omolar was telling us. So is this a moment or is this a movement for permanent change? It really is up to us. We can ensure that this moment of hope uh, doesn't fall prey to naive optimism or to paralyzing pessimism. Uh, I've, heard, I've learned so much in the past hour about investing transparently, about uh, uh, building our internal values and measuring for them. Uh, and, and, and we heard here about from, you know, how to build an actual dialogue in community with each other. And we've, as we're talking about funding and investing, and as, as you're thinking about funding and investing, um, I like to think of the difference between charity and justice. Charity asks, What's wrong? How can I help? And Justice asks, why is this happening? And how can I change it? So let our investing and our funding bring more than charity. Let them bring justice to the communities of this country that have been systemically marginalized and discriminated against through policies and biases. We can write the next chapter of our history with the ink of justice. 
And the work continues, really. Um, if you're interested in SOL's activities in the US, I invite you to join us for the Indigenous and Anti-Racist Innovators Summit, which will happen June 16 to 17 in Minneapolis. Uh, grab any of us, we'll tell you more about it. So that's it for us. Uh, you, I'm going to ask everyone to make your way now to the Sandberg building. What awaits you there, besides lunch, is two rounds of uh, breakout sessions. And we'll see you back here for a really interesting plenary at 3.30 that you will not want to miss with a lot of uh, really interesting speakers from all over uh, the world and sectors. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for listening. Uh, and see you later. Thanks.